Hello and welcome to Patent's webcast series, Leaders and Learning in Literacy. In this webcast series, we talk with practitioners and researchers throughout the country who can inform us about the best research in reading. Uh, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner and I serve uh, as a Patent State Lead Consultant for Literacy and it's a great honor. Also a great honor today is welcoming Emily Hanford to our webcast. Good morning, good morning Emily. <laughs> So Hi, nice to morning. see you. Well, let me just give uh, our folks who might not know you, which I can't imagine who that might be, but a little bit of information about who you are. Um, Emily Hanford is a senior producer and correspondent for American Public Media Reports. Emily has been working in public media for more than two decades as a reporter, producer, editor, news director, and program host. To say that Emily Hanford is an acclaimed education reporter is a profound understatement. Just over a year ago, last September, um, Emily's hard words, why aren't kids being taught to read, brought mainstream, mainstream media attention to the importance of teacher knowledge about the science of reading. To say hard words sent shockwaves across <laughs> the nation and across the world about the science of reading is truly an understatement and how important explicit and systematic phonics is to kids. Conversations about how we teach reading in the United States and how teachers are prepared or, or not prepared, and I'll just speak personally for myself, uh, to teach reading has been a largely an insulated one just in this education community. And you have really amplified that um, conversation out to all realms. Um, after hard words, um, there were um, video uh, and interviews with you with National Public Radio, um, with Education Week, an op-ed piece in the New York Times. So. It just, um, when uh, I read this from your uh, media folks, uh, it really said when they said shockwaves, it was just truly the right word to describe um, what hard words did to amplify the importance of the science of reading and explicit and some systematic instruction in phonics. So thank you for that because that's a message that really needs to be out there. And now with this new um, uh, report, report that you did just a couple weeks ago, At a Loss for Words, You've really gone even deeper into the science of reading and brought to the forefront the three queuing system. So thank you for all this reporting, uh, Emily. And is there anything else you'd like folks to know about you before we continue? Well, I guess I'll start as an introduction to talking about reading that um, I have been an education reporter for more than a decade, but I'm relatively new to this whole reading thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I spent most of my career focused mostly on um, secondary ed and higher ed. And it was like three, I guess getting close to four years ago now that I started getting in, to get interested in reading. And it was actually through looking particularly at dyslexia and mm -hmm. the problems that kids who are really struggling with reading and have dyslexia or their parents think they have dyslexia, how hard it was for them to get the help they need in school. And it was that reporting that led me to more to, to, towards the science of reading and core reading instruction, because if there was one big takeaway from the reporting on dyslexia and getting to know many of the very um, active parents, moms out there of dyslexic kids, is that at the root of the sort of dyslexia issue when it comes to kids with dyslexia not getting help in school, mm -hmm. I think that there just isn't a good general understanding of the reading process, how reading works, what's going on when when something is going wrong, when a kid is struggling. So that's what really led it to me and I, uh, led me to this topic. And I think just as a reporter, I became profoundly curious because I started to learn about the science and it was, shocking because mm -hmm. what I realized is that um, cognitive scientists and other researchers have spent the last 30, 40 years, 40 years <laughs> yes. intensely studying this and have learned so much about how reading works. And there's just a very big disconnect between mm -hmm. what the scientists have learned and what teachers are taught in their teacher preparation programs and what they get the chance to learn on the job. And my most recent reporting is focusing fact that I think it's not just that they're not getting education about the science of reading, but that they're actually learning some things that are wrong about how reading works some profound misunderstandings and misconceptions. And so what we have going on in schools is not just that there's a lack of good phonics instruction and other kinds of the pieces that would lead to skilled reading development, but that in some curriculum materials are really kind of, and 
teacher preparation programs, I would say, are leading teachers astray. In the wrong, yes, definitely in the wrong direction. Is there anything in the, in the past year that you're still reflecting on? You know, you've had quite a journey in this past year between hard words and everything else. Is there anything in the, the past year that still surprises you about reading instruction in the United States, uh, teacher preparation, or um, different methodologies for teaching reading? Is there anything that still you're kind of like, you said you were shocked, and I know lots of people are when they, when they hear about the science of reading, they think, why um, don't we learn this in our undergraduate? I, and I, again, I'll just speak personally for myself. In my undergraduate, in my graduate degrees, in my reading cert certification, all those areas, I was, never, I was never taught the science of reading. And in fact, as you said, I was taught the exact opposite. And so um, I know you had posted something on Twitter last night about a teacher you know, saying that it's almost like saying there is no God. Um, but it is a, it is a profoundly um, you know, difficult thing to hear because teachers go into teaching because they really want to make a difference for kids. We rely on our institutions of higher education and others to uh, or believe that they are current with the research. And so um, we find it very, um, like I said, almost like the five stages of grief that we go through when we hear about the science of reading. So is there anything that still sh you know, shocks you or surprises you in this past year? Well, two things. I mean, I think a lot of times at the end of my work day when I've been talking to people on the phone and reading research and articles, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. often just continue to be shocked at the, at the breadth of the disconnect, like yeah. the width of the disconnect, <laughs> honestly. But I think the other thing that's really important in this whole conversation is that you know, I, I just, I've learned so much from teachers. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things I've learned, maybe even especially since this most recent documentary came out, is that there are a lot of teachers out there who know that there's something they don't know. They're beginning to get inklings that there's something that they haven't been taught and they want to know more about it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there are a lot of teachers out there who do know this science and research. Yes. They do get it. And they're often alone. There's no one else in their school or their district. Um, they begin to question themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they've read this stuff and they've learned it, and but they are not in a place where they can utilize it very well. They don't get a lot of support. They get a lot of pushback. And I think the other thing that, that really is shocking at the end of the day, hey, hey there's, there's, big, there's big lot there's a sunk cost thing going on where schools have invested a lot in materials that are not that are a little bit off in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. how the those approaches are understanding the process of learning to read. It doesn't mean that like everything about some of these materials that schools have invested in are wrong and they need to get rid of everything. But there's something, especially at the early stages of learning how to read, that the curriculum materials that rely on this queuing approach. And it is foundational. This queuing idea is really foundational is. in a lot of the curriculum materials that are out there. Um, so I think there's a lot of pushback when teachers speak up about it and say, I don't think this is quite quite right. I don't want to use this assessment. I don't want to use these level books. I don't want to teach this lesson. They get a lot of pushback um, from people above them. And, 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 and actually sometimes their peers as well. You know, yes, their peers as well, sometimes there's, a, there's pushback. Or just wondering why and how could you think that. And so I can just think, you know, talk from some personal experience. It can be a very lonely experience. Um, I think that's why sometimes places like the Reading League as well, like, you know, I, I know um, folks feel like I've found my tribe, right, that I'm not alone, but still being in a situation where you learn the science can sometimes be just as disconcerting because you're in a system that really is, is teaching the exact opposite. And much like um, your uh, teachers and reading specialists in the Oakland, California School District are finding themselves as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of dissonance. And, you know, we, we always say when we know better, we do better, but sometimes as teachers we're in systems that have invested, uh, you know, in some cases millions of dollars in curriculum and don't want to make the shift. And so it is a, it is a very, very big problem. So, you know, this three queuing system to, line, yes, go ahead. I think that line when we know better, we do better is very frustrating for it a lot is. of teachers. Yes. Because mm -hmm. they, they know better, but they can't necessarily do better on their own. Um, they need support from people around them. They need better materials. They need better professional development. I think the other thing that's just so tricky about this is that even, you know, places that have invested really heavily in materials that don't quite align with the science, most of them didn't do that on purpose. I mean, yeah. I haven't met 
people who are in education and don't want children to learn how to read, mm -hmm. don't want to teach children how to read. It's just that there's so many misconceptions swirling around and people have really bought a kind of point of view, a belief system, a set of procedures and things that they do in their teaching. And they've come to accept that as the way you do it. And it's almost like there's no other way. I mean, people have described to me that I didn't know there was another way to do it. Right. And of course, you know, there's a certain percentage of kids who are going to learn to read pretty well, no matter what. That's you right. Do. In spite of, um, yes. In spite mm -hmm. of. In spite of. And in some teachers will have some, in some schools, in some places, it could be most of the kids in your class are that way. So it might look very much like what you're doing is working. Mm -hmm. Most teachers that I've had a chance to talk to about this, though, are like, I knew I've always had this little pit in my stomach because right. there were maybe a handful of kids that it wasn't working for. Right. Right. No why. And then for some for some teachers who are in higher needs schools, it was like it wasn't working for most of my kids. Right. But I didn't know what to, I thought. What it was else me. to do? What else to do? You know? What else and then we do? come up with all these, all these, it's, it's me and I'm not doing well enough. I need to learn this better. I need to go to more PD. Uh, it's the kids. They're just, they have too many problems, too many challenges at home. Right. right. Nobody's reading. We've them. heard that. These are all real things. I mean, coming from a poor family and having challenges at home, we can get into this video. That does affect a kid's yes. process. Yes. It's boring to read. Sure. Um, but there is there is no reason why a kid from a poor home can't become a good reader. Um, and what you know what we find is that there's a percentage of kids, obviously, and I think it's a fairly small percentage of kids, uh, based on the research, who for sort of neurobiological reasons are going to really struggle with learning to right. read. Right, and they, we say two to five percent in the research. So if you're not at ninety five percent in your school, then maybe there's some things we can think about in terms of instruction and curricular materials that can support all kids. You know, every child has the right to learn to read. You know, I know you f feel the same way. That's really a social justice issue as well, that every child has the right to read. So I think it's so tricky too the social justice part of it, because I think a lot of teachers really do care very, you know, are in education or are motivated by social justice yes. reasons. And a lot of teachers who haven't been equipped well are, are really doing it for that reason too. Um, and so a lot of people here, when I talk about the science and say things like you should really only have three to 5% of kids in your school who are struggling with reading, you know, a lot of teachers get really offended because they come into school every day and they are in tough conditions. Like they do yes. have kids yes. who are coming to school. They don't have a lot of resources. They face an uphill battle every day. The question really needs to be though, since we do know that poverty is not a reason for not being a good reader. That's there right. are some reasons you might not be a good reader, but poverty really isn't at the end of the day if you're doing all the pieces of reading instruction. Right. That is not the end of and the day. And we have evidence for that in many places. Yes. But we need to help teachers. We need to we need to help teachers know the evidence base so that they know that and then give them the resources that they need to be able to teach all the pieces of mm -hmm together to make skilled reading so that all those kids can be successful. Yeah. And, and that's not a normal experience for the most part. Um, uh, that information, has, it's been out there for more than 40 years, but that, that chasm between university and teacher preparation and even in service in school districts, we're really in a status quo around the three queuing system. It is at the foundation of many resources and materials. Um, and uh, that guess that guessing game, and uh, you know what struck me is the way you introduced out of loss for words was that, you know, picture power. How, you know, we look to the picture for the meaning of the text, and yet we don't bring kids to the text itself and the internal structure of the words. Um, you know, we have an alphabetic language, we have a writing system that's based on speech to print, and yet we're we're really cueing kids to do what poor readers do. Is so as you really explore this more. Um, surprising to you that um, it's so prolific, uh, that we have just these individual, you know, pockets of places where we do know the science and we're acting on it, like in the, the SIPs, um, uh, in terms of the students that they're engaged in, but that was surprising to you too, because yes, no. And how was your conversation? I guess you went right to the source. Um, you went right to Ken and Yetta Goodman, um, and you know, Ken's paper back in 1967, that psycholinguistic guessing game, and so, 
Um, I appreciate that you went right to the source and also that Ken and Yetta Goodman were willing to talk to you, but I guess tell me a little bit about that experience, about um, you know, meeting with them, talking about the three queuing system, and any surprises as you dug, like almost like peeled the onion here with the three queuing system that might have surprised you. Let me just, I'll just back up and tell you kind of how I came to even know what the three queuing system was. Because uh, one of the things that I've understood is that a lot of teachers actually don't know that term. And wow. I, I point that yeah, out. Yeah, they know the MSV. They know MSV, yes. meaning structural, which is very um, big in some materials that are widely used, uh, Fountas and Pinnell, Guided Reading, Reader's Workshop, um, right. those LLI. ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those ideas are there. Anyway, after I did hard words, I think one of the things that I took away from that. So that piece um, really focused on sort of what is the evidence base? What is the science? It did get to phonics and the important role of phonics and how we've been fighting about phonics and just basically the role of sound and learning and how to read and phonemic mm -hmm. awareness. Um, and it, that piece did not say that phonics is the only thing that kids right. need. Um, but it points out just how critical that is in the early stages of reading. And I really tried to help people understand why phonics is so important. Because I think one of the reasons we fought about phonics for so long is just a misunderstanding of the role it plays in learning how to read. It's not the only thing. Yes. But, you know, good readers have good phonics skills. You don't necessarily need to be taught those skills. Some kids really pick that up um, through a lot of exposure and being on mommy's, you know, right. lap and letters and sounds. But I think one of the things that's become clear to me as a reporter, and that was clear when I did hard words, is that there are a lot of schools that are doing phonics, some kind right. of phonics. They mm -hmm. call it phonics. Impressive. Right? Some kind of word work. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we kind of got two issues here, I think. Like on the one hand, it's the question of like the phonics instruction itself. Is it high quality enough? Do the teachers know what the, enough about the structure of the written language? language to teach it well? Do they have good materials? Do they understand why it's so important? Are they teaching enough of it? Do they recognize how important it is at those early stages, right? So we've got a lot of questions to ask about phonics instruction. But if you look at the sort of large history of the debates about reading, the question of like whether to teach phonics was a big part of the de debate for a long time. And I would say that that is mostly off the table. It is not mostly off the table. I think everyone knows we need to teach phonics. It's just that, are they teaching it explicitly? Are they teaching it systematically? I always say, like, you know, in the early grades or anyone who's an early reader, where you could be not five or 95, um, it needs to be the main course, right? With lots of oral language uh, and vocabulary for kids, oral language from the teacher, oral language expectations of the kids, but it needs to be the main course. And, and a lot of the curriculum materials that I was teaching years ago, it was um, salt and pepper <laughs> or an appetizer where um, one word you mention in the at a loss for words is, you, know, you go through this progression of phonics, whole word reading, whole language, and then you know, really this hybrid we've had for a number of years now, balanced literacy, where um, there is some recognition that phonics is important. And so the curriculum materials do have it, but it's not explicit, it's not systematic, it doesn't go in a scope and sequence from least complex to most complex. And so you know, our kids are not getting that firm foundation in the structure of the English language. And you know, there's, no uh, no, there's no comprehension strategy that's gonna compensate for the fact that you can't read the words. And so um, it's not balanced literacy. I, I hear at Patton, we always say it's like proportional, right? We're always working on, when we think about the simple view of reading or Scarborough's reading rope, word recognition and language comprehension always. But intentionally, you're spending proportionally more of your instructional time making sure that kids have that code down and that they're not getting engaged in bad habits that poor readers use and that we as teachers are not the ones who are uh, teaching those poor strategies. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that were the uh, couple of things that I sort of began to understand about balanced literacy. It's, it's obviously really important that the kind of main meal at the early stages is understanding the alphabetic principle yeah. and the way the written language works, right? Mm -hmm. Phonics is part of that. There's more to that ultimately to understand the way a written language works because English is not a transparent, you know, right. morphology, uh, etymology, all of that. Yes. Exactly. Right. So, so the, so when you talk about balanced literacy, it's, it's, it's obviously true that, that, Understanding the alphabetic principle and the sounds and letters is one part of it, but then language comprehension, mm -hmm. as we know from the 
critical view of reading, right, is a huge part of it. So you do want to be exposing kids to great read alouds and good literature and getting them, um, you know, into real books when they can read the words yes. and liter great literature is really important and exposure is really important and lots of time for reading is really, really important. And so, but I think one of the takeaways I had as a reporter is just recognizing when you really look at what scientists have figured out about how people learn to read, balanced literacy is not really taking those two parts and putting them together. When you look carefully at a lot of balanced literacy materials, it's a lot of different theories about how reading works. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of the whole word kind of idea that you, there's a long list of words to memorize. Yes, sight, and you words, just, to mem just, sight words to right? memorize, yes. So if you look, you're gonna have, you're gonna have sight words to memorize. and. Sure, there are some high frequency words, right? When kids are really young to be able to let them read books and sentences that you're gonna have to show, you know, have kids quote unquote memorize. But if Not you look many, a lot yes. of the, mm -hmm. you look a lot of the sight word lists that kids are getting, They're all those decodable. are words that can be decoded. And maybe they can't be decoded yet. This gets to the question of decodable readers. Like maybe those words shouldn't be words that kids are encountering right. yet in books. They should not. <laughs> they should encounter the words that they can decode, that they can read. Yeah, and, and so, so I, the, I often hear a knock on, and I don't know if you do, on decodable text. Um, they say they're like dry, and I say, well, there's nothing that um, is so motivating as success. That yeah. when I, as a child, I can pick up a book that I independently can read that text, that, that is so, uh, so motivating. I, I know as a teacher, I mean, when kids run around with that book and say, you know, because I have uh, grandkids, right? I have a five-year-old. I can read. I'm a reader because um, my Leo, he hasn't had to experience or guess at any word that he doesn't know. He is successful because he's been taught all those spelling patterns, some of those high-frequency words, right? But I'm still, and you know, with uh, those high-frequency words, I'm pointing out the regular parts where they can map sound, you know, those sound spellings, right? That there might be a one little part that's irregular here, but it's just, we're going to use our sound spelling for that word as well. But there's a lot of knock on decodable text, and yet um, kids find them profoundly motivating because they are successful reading them. And they're not getting those bad habits of guessing it because there's no need to guess. I've been taught, and it gives so much information back to the teacher. You've taught these skills in isolation, and now we're going to see, can we transfer these into connected text? It gives me so much formative feedback about how my student learn these skills. But I don't know if you hear that about decodable text. Oftentimes we do. But um, you know we, we're big proponents here at Patton. The Reading League is, is as well in terms of decodable text. And really looking at Aries phases of word reading for when we decide when kids are ready to be released to more uh, authentic text. But do you find that with decodable text? And I was wondering if that's why you put that into your Atalas for words, or if it was just <laughs> part of the SIPS program and it just came up. Oh, no, no, no. That, I, I'm very aware of the debate about okay. decodable text. And, um, you know, two things I think, it, it's, obvi it's obvious that we want kids to be out of decodable text Right, there are I mean, they, yes. You know, yep. Once kids have got some of the basic ph phonics patterns and they're able to read words, and there's no reason why you can't, doesn't mean they can't take on a book that's not totally decodable and try to make sense of it. But I think the big um, aha I had about balanced literacy really came to recognizing this whole queuing system thing and yes. what it was and the fact that teaching kids to read words using context and prediction is teaching them precisely the way that poor readers read. So kids, many kids are going to learn to read a little bit that way, mm -hmm. right? And some kids are going to overcome that. Like when the kids who have good phonological skills, who start to understand the alphabetic principle and the ways it sounds and letters work, they're going to drop the cueing strategies quickly because they realize that sounding out a word is the most efficient way to know what it is. But I, when I, st I started interviewing people about this and really recognizing that the habits of poor readers are precisely the things that kids are being taught and that some kids can overcome that, but some kids can't. Many they kids. really get mm -hmm. stuck on that. And we're, the very thing that kids need to be doing at the early stage of learning to read, which is looking really carefully at those words and sort of grunting and groaning and sounding them out. Right, but how that and helps them orthographically map that word because they're mapping the speech sounds and the pronunciation to the letters and the letter sequences. That's that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's just, I, I think that, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is an apt analogy, but <laughs> I think that the Q 
queuing system is almost like a little bit like a little bit of like a virus that's running through our curriculum in our schools mm -hmm. you know like without it's there and it's it's making some kids sicker than others you know what I mean? like, yes, yes. And, and can't really get rid of it um it's just sort of pervaded and i think the really important thing in in actually getting to a place where we have most kids getting the basics of reading is getting rid of that cueing idea mm -hmm. there's no evidence for it in the cognitive science it is not the and way there that hasn't been so I, you know, you wonder why it persists. I mean, all you have to do is really look at our reading outcomes in the United States to see, um, you know, that, that something needs to change. So I, you just wonder why it continually persists. I think belief systems are hard um, to change. You know, those schemas that we have are very, very difficult to change. And even when we're in the process of changing and learning more about the science, the environments that we're often in as teachers don't support that knowledge or that practice so and it's really our kids who suffer as a result of that so i, I think back to your molly and your claire um in in the at a loss for words and her um, the word you didn't use was horror but almost like this horror when she saw in her child's kindergarten classroom where they were you know looking at the picture book and there was uh you're know, hiding the word and you were saying well we're gonna buh, buh, what could it be and let's look at the picture and so that we are teaching the habits of poor readers and not asking kids to look at the internal structure, as well as that little um, interview with the two children when they were asked, like, well, what makes you a good reader? One, I look through the word, and that is what makes me a good reader, I sound it out, and the other ones, I look at the picture to read words. And so it's when we teach kids these habits, they, they stick and they persist. And even in environments where there is some phonics, if we're teaching the three cueing system, it's almost like we're bipolar or schizophrenic, right? And kids tend to, especially our more at-risk learners, tend to engage in um, the picture looking or the guessing. And um, I can speak, you know, for you know, lots of students that I work with, they might have had great language, great compensators. They compensated for what they didn't know in the code for a long time, and then all of a sudden in our country, we have what we call the fourth grade slump. And yet that was there all along. It says the kids were compensating and we never really taught them how to decode or prompted them to decode through words. And so they're almost like this hidden, um, we're, we're, you're, we're causing these, dis, not, maybe not disabilities, but these reading problems that you know, kids have to, like Molly, have to work through her entire life. I think one of the things too, um, when when you go into a school and there's like 20 minutes of phonics and then kids go to guided reading a reader's workshop right. and they're taught cueing, um, one of the the sort of questions I have is that if teachers were really being provided the knowledge, the cognitive science on reading, they would see that there's a disconnect there. That you wouldn't teach phonics in one part of the day and teach cueing in another part of the day. Yeah. And the fact is that a lot of teachers don't see that dissonance which isn't their fault, it's that they haven't been given the background to understand well enough why and how phonics matter so much. Mm -hmm. So, which is why the solution to the problem we're having with reading is not good phonics programs and just training on the phonics program unless it comes with a much deeper sort of knowledge base about why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. What I've found when I've talked to teachers who really have started to understand the science is they themselves start to look at the stuff where they're saying, look, the first letter, right. skip the word. Much like your <laughs> teachers in Oakland, right? Yeah. Much like and the they, teachers they're they're in their Oakland. Own realization, many of them don't start with like an article about what's wrong with the three queuing system. They start with understanding how children learn to read and the role of phonics and phonemic awareness. And then they start to look at some of the stuff they're teaching and they start to think, huh, right. what's going that on? That doesn't really yeah. work. And that really goes back to your hard words and uh, letters uh, training and what a difference that made, right? It's really always boils down. And Louisa, of course, you interviewed in hard words, always down to teacher knowledge, right? So even right. if and they are in a position of having, you know, poor materials in front of them, they can uh, choose not to prompt kids in a way, um, you know, that's causing them to guess. But you also have to remember that some teachers know that they're not going to do that, but they're supposed to comply. They're supposed to oh, teach know. the lesson that's been given to them. And so they're in quite a pickle. They are. You know, they really are. So, I mean, I think I've come away from the reporting on this just with a sense of this is so unfair to teachers. I mean, mm -hmm. teaching is a really hard job. And 
for the most part, teachers are doing it because they really care about kids. That's true. And early elementary teachers want to teach kids how to read. I have to tell you that I've talked to a lot of teachers who after their teacher prep, they thought they wanted to be a kindergarten or first grade teacher. And at the end, they actually realized like, I no one taught me how to teach kids to read. And isn't that what you're supposed to do in kindergarten right. or first grade? Right. Yeah. And they said, I, as quickly as I could, I got to fourth grade or above. <laughs> and I realized yeah. I didn't know how to teach kids to read. But then what happens to them is they get all these fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Right. And they're like, percentage of my kids really don't like reading. They don't right. really like reading. But if you dig down, if you take, if you really have those kids read, you realize that a lot of them, are skipping the words. Mm -hmm. uh, they've not worth the right. They, they right. Do well, not you know right away. Just as uh, your tutor in the at a loss for words was saying, you know, uh, as soon as and same thing too. If I sit and read with a child, when they start looking at a picture or guessing and throwing any kind of word in there that starts with that same letter sounds, not looking through the internal structure of the word, um, you know right away that they've been they've been taught they've been taught to do that. It isn't like you know they. Maybe, that's, the thing, maybe the other thing, of course, like Molly, who's the mom right. in at a loss words she doesn't remember being taught that i think that these are strategies that people who are poor readers will come up with in the absence of good phonics instruction right, right? Mm -hmm. so it can be both but the thing that i think is shocking and that people need to realize is that when someone has difficulty with reading and no one teaches them how to read they will come up with these strategies on their own mm -hmm. why are we teaching the strategies that poor, poor readers, readers come use. up with on their own two kids who are five and six years old who are just learning how to read. That is shocking. And I don't think a lot of teachers, they just don't realize that. No. They don't realize well, that they're teaching. Much like in your interview with Donald Bolger, you know, knowing that um, that teaching uh, with phonics is mapping and wiring our brain the way, we, you know, we learn to read versus the opposite. I just don't think that knowledge is, I don't think that knowledge is out there. I don't. Right. And no. as someone, as Someone, I, I think it was Reed Lyon, I was just reading something recently, like phonics has become the F word in our <laughs> Or, you know, sometimes they're called phonicators or something like that, you know, I and it's know. just not the it truth. Is, it's, really, it's really important, I think, to acknowledge, though, that the science of reading does not equal phonics. Right. It's just that the science of reading recognizes the critical role of sort of phonology in learning how to read and understanding the alphabetic principle and understanding the ways it sounds and letters works. English is an alphabetic language kids need to understand that and there is this language comprehension side of it that is so important essential and in at a loss for words i really tried to show that in the example of yes, the classroom yes in Oakland, where you want to have really good phonics instruction but you want to have good read alouds where you're killing building kids vocabulary and their knowledge that is something that's really missing is a lot of the curriculum in the early grades or that's true ever yes is knowledge rich and we know we know, for example, that kids who maybe don't have really great word recognition skills in middle school, if you give them a passage that they know something about, they're going to get more, more of that because they can, they, they, they have can the use knowledge. right. They have background knowledge, mm -hmm. and you can sort of, you know, lots of people who don't have great word identification skills. There's a lot of highly functional dyslexics who've come up with all kinds of strategies and stuff to get through text, but you talk to most of them and they say it takes forever. Yes. It's really tiring. M and much I like Molly. Like to read. I don't like to read. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those chicken and egg things we've got wrong because I think a lot of the balanced literacy stuff sort of assumes that the key ingredient is motivation and that if you like to read, you will read and that's how you learn the language. And it's really the opposite. It's right. when like get access to what those words on the page say that you read more and more when that right. begins to come easily to you, when it becomes automatic, you like to read. And then what the research shows, the self-teaching hypothesis right. kicks David in. Right. Like, exactly. Most of mm -hmm. most of us are going to teach ourselves most of the words right. we know how to read ourselves through right. encountering them. But we've got the basic skills to take a whack at it phonetically, sound it out, see if it's a word we know or not, guess the meaning of it using context if we need to. Because it seems like we use context to read words, and that's what teachers don't. Like a lot of the things that it seems like we're doing when we read, we're not actually doing. And there's this key difference between being a skilled reader and being a kid who's at the yes, very beginning of the a process. A novice, nascent reader. And a, lot, yes. a lot of what I see in a lot of balanced literacy materials is kind of an assumption that the way to skilled reading is mimicking what experts do, right. rather than going through a 
bunch of stages, as we know from Ari and others. Right, her phases, get, yes. Get from non-reading to pre-reading and you emergent reading, and I can't remember all the names of them. And then you become uh, yes, a pre-alphabetic and all the way through alphabetic and early alphabetic, later alphabetic consolidated, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and once you become an expert at reading, it's very, very hard to know what it's an expert at anything. You can't really put yourself in the shoes of the person no. who can't. Once you can ride a bike, you think, why can't you Everybody ride a bike? Everybody else ride a bike. You forget yeah. about all that balancing and how did you move all that, like with any skill. Yes, I don't understand why that is with reading, but it is. It is what has happened. And I think the three queuing system has been, a, and the MSV has been a big part of that. It truly has, and as uh, Stacy said, and on a loss for words, Stacy Turney here in Pennsylvania, it just seems intuitive, and it's easier to teach, and I have materials that align with it. So it's a it's a cascading effect. A cascading and I think that's effect. what you know. It's it's the default. It's become the default it in is. American school. Um, and I and I think it's trying to uh, helping people recognize that and just how ubiquitous it mm -hmm. is. Yes, as Dave Kilpatrick um, said. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I loved yeah. how uh, you explained orthographic mapping. Uh, that in that conversation with Dave, I thought it was the most succinct, accessible way. That's what I uh, love about all your reporting. It's really based on the the science and the foundation and the research, but it's very accessible to many people. And I think that's why your reporting has really resonated with so many people. Um, uh, I know I'm working with the superintendent in a large school district. And uh, the way he reached out to Patton was because of your uh, documentaries. He said, I listened to Emily Hanford, and now I'm asking all these questions, and can we have a conversation? And uh, he's not the only one. There's, uh, you have really been a catalyst uh, for uh, a conversation that's been uh, so essential. I mean, I, I told you I, when I saw you last time, I recall, I'm sure you've heard about it, the Hanford effect and the impact it's having on, um, on education and the impact you're having on students' lives and teachers. And uh, also, too, you're not just a reporter reporting about something. You, you know, I know you audited a class. Um, you're a prolific reader, researcher, conversationer with lots of people in the field. So it's, you have really um, committed to and very passionate about this work, and I want to thank you for that. It's making a big difference. So um, what's been the uh, reaction to out of loss for words? We'll just do that for a moment, and then we'll talk about maybe what's next, and we'll wrap up. So what's been the reaction so far? Because I, I mean, really hard words is just almost like, uh, I, almost, I uh, remember I said, uh, you know, you talk about a pebble and a pond. Yours is more like a boulder that went into a pond and just echoed across the entire nation and actually across the whole wide world in terms of the science of reading, phonics, and now this three queuing system. What's been the reaction so far? Well, I think, um I think in some ways hard words because it looked back at kind of the reading wars and it did focus on phonics and the role of phonics. I think that the reception to that was people, it, it kind of like people can easily figure out what to do with that. They're like, oh, this is a lady. She's talking about phonics again. We've talked about phonics, <laughs> intensive phonics, blah, blah, blah. It's like it, 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 that piece came along and it was kind of easy, I think, for some people to dismiss and criticize. My sense so far about mm -hmm. at a loss for words is that it's been a little bit harder for a lot of people to know what to make of it, because I think that it does kind of hit at something that's a little bit less known and seen. Mm -hmm. People have been talking about phonics and debating phonics, and there's kind of like a typical argument about it right. that has played over decades. And if people hear anything about it, they can put it into that argument that they've heard before. But I don't think this think this stuff about queuing and MSV and the lack of evidence for it in the cognitive science is just something that people know about and have really thought about how do we read words? How does mm -hmm. a skilled reader read words? What have cognitive scientists figured out about that? It's completely fascinating, which is what really sustains my interest in this topic mm -hmm. is that it's intellectually fascinating it and as a reporter for more than 10 years, I think primarily what I've been interested in is equity and opportunity in education. Yes. And if there is a if there is an issue that goes closer, <laughs> that gets more at the foundation in the beginning of this, it's reading and yes. early reading instruction in mm -hmm. particular. So I think my sense a little bit about at a loss for words is that for some people it's where hard words was sort of challenging at a loss for words is kind of stunning mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Yes. Like yeah. I get the sense that they're a little bit stunned by it. And I've, I've talked to some people who are um, skeptical of the sort of argument and right. base in there. I've, I've engaged some people on the phone who've, who've kind of 
who reached out to me and said, I, I, I need to talk to you about this because you don't understand, you know, I've right. been doing this for a long time and you don't understand how kids learn to read. And I've, I've um, gotten into some conversation and I would say just at the end of the conversation, I, I think that they're a little bit at a loss for words. <laughs> One of the, and I, I'm not saying that in a kind of winning way. Like I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to win any arguments here. I just really want people to know this and like see what this evidence base is and realize how vast it is and just see the connection between the cognitive science evidence base and what's really happening in classrooms and see that there's, that it's just not there. And people can, there's lots of research that goes on in schools of education. There's lots of literacy experts. There's lots of literacy research. I tried very hard in this most recent piece to just be like the cognitive science research. Like what have the cognitive scientists figured out about what right. is going on on our brain and, and what skilled readers do versus non-skilled readers. And just the question I think to teachers is, do you want to teach your kids how to be skilled readers or do you want to teach your kids how to be unskilled readers? Right. Yes. No one is teaching their kids to be an unskilled reader deliberately. No. They're not. No, much um, like a teacher in Oakland who said, um, I, did I teach my kids this is a sound out word or this is a sight word and that is it. Those are the only skills that we work on. But I, I do think that at a loss for words will, because you're going um, deeper into the instructional practices, I do think that folks are going to be looking at their curricular materials. I think there'll be many more conversations around curriculum materials and methodologies and you know seeing well do, you know does this prompting uh, mirror the three queuing system or MSV or does it keep kids in the internal structure of words and that sound spelling correspondence is it helping them with orth orthographic mapping build that large sight word vocabulary a sight word any word I know as if I know by sight right or is it leading them to away from the text and uh, what poor readers do but I I predict it might take a little bit more time for people to really puzzle through this because um, it's not something, you know, certainly the phonics debate, as you said, is something we all have, you know, talk about. But the three queuing system, I think, is a wonderful um, uh, docu-series that you did to really further that conversation. And thank you for that. I think the problem is that at the end of the day, it's cheaper and easier to buy a phonics program and train teachers on that and just add that in. So it's like the phonics patch or the phonics band-aid. Yes. And I think that's going on all over the country. It's much harder to look carefully at all the materials that you're using and ask, does this line up with right. what we know about how to learn to I read? think how confusing that is to does. kids, right? How confusing that is to children, right? And what, what's and going to be the much default? Harder it's much harder to help teachers. I think it's much easier just in general, in life or whatever, to add things than to take them away. Yes. And also recognizing that school districts have spent across the country hundreds of millions of dollars yes. on this stuff. Yeah. So it is not, if you lead a district that just invested a lot of money, and there's plenty of them out there in some of these materials, what do you do? Do you go to your school board? Do you go to your taxpayers and say, whoops, we just spent several million dollars on the wrong thing and we're just gonna, we're gonna either get rid of it or we're gonna go through it and take a bunch of it away and kind of restructure it and have, right. you know. And I think a lot of people, a lot of school leaders don't actually realize that there are other good options out there mm -hmm. um, for curriculum and, um, but it's a big lift, it you know, and lift. I mean, you know, school system you're talking about hundreds you're talking about thousands of teachers that need training this is not cheap and it's not fast and well, our kids deserve it right and our <laughs> teachers and our teachers yeah. deserve and our teachers deserve this knowledge they do I, I think so yeah. yeah so what's next for you Emily <laughs> I can't wait to see what you're going to do next I know um, you'll be at the reading league it's exciting to see you there um, but what's yep. next for you with education reporting or in the near future um, in terms of this realm? You know, if I look back at my whole career in reporting, <laughs> one project always leads to another. It so happens the last few years, one project about reading has led to another. I hope I'm still gonna be able to do reporting on reading. I have many questions that still need answers um, that I would, I have a long list of things that I would like to do. I don't know which ones I will get to do or do next, um, but I'm hoping I, I'm hoping oh, it will. So well, we, we are hoping you. too. We can't imagine. Um, your voice has made such a difference. We're very, very grateful for it and, and grateful for all this time with you today. Thank you so very much.
Um, You're welcome. Uh, so this is uh, Pam Castor saying goodbye uh, from this uh, Leaders and Learning webcast series here at Patton. Thank you to John Ragsdale, our producer, and a special thanks to Emily Hanford for all she does to support all kids in reading and teachers as well. And uh, thank you for coming today, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.